All right, sorry for that delay. All right, well, um, thank you to Blair for setting me up very well, touching on many of the challenges that, um, that e in fact, that Erica, uh, another former student, as she mentioned, um, had uh, led us to um, try to move our technique into the infrared. And so what I'm gonna do today is in some sense foreshadow probably some things Erica will talk about and Seth will talk about, um, but try to focus on going beyond mean flow and thinking about some of the metrics that can be measured outside of um, the traditional areas of interest. This all goes back to, and this video is probably 10 years old now, walking around in nature, of course, we all are very familiar with these boils. They've come up through many talks today and they capture um, integral length scales as Blair was talking about, and they are ubiquitous, whether the flow is frozen and breaking up, um, we saw ice out yesterday in Canada, and here's ice again in just south of Canada in Ithaca. Um, but also, you know, here's a, a, a river in Switzerland. Um, you know, incredibly easy to see even at night with white light. And many of you are using white light to, to capture some of these images, to use a variety of LSPIV or um, um, uh, electromagnetic radar-based approaches. We're working in the infrared, and Seth will talk more about some of the infrared details, and you'll see some images in a minute. Um, but one of the challenges of infrared is that you have to um, be able to uh, see not just the, uh, the image, but also um, the, the dark and the bright. And so what you see down here is that I have um, uh, black spots and white spots. This was actually a granular flow, not an infrared image. Um, but we're tracking this flow and we want to track both the dark and the bright. And LSPIV traditionally is a correlation based technique. And as the majority of you realize, correlation, of course, tracks either the high or the low, but not both. So we want to grab both. There are a variety of techniques to do that. We're working with MQD, which is just a pattern matching technique that looks for um, the minimum quadratic difference. And we move a subregion around and find that minimum where both the bright and the dark regions in the image are tracked. So can we see these motions in the infrared? And, um, and of course we can. And so what we've done is we put a camera right here. Uh, we've got a, um, uh, an, 80, uh, an 80 V sitting right here and you'll see the wake coming off that in a minute. And so here's a flow. Um, so here's that wake I mentioned, the von Karman streak in the tail of the, um, uh, of the ADV. There's another Aquadop instrument that is also sort of same diameter, seeing the same von Karman characteristic length scales. We see a much slower eddy um, uh, setting up uh, from the von Karman Street um, off the piling cluster. We also see structures coming off the bed and then structures moving, um, you know, coming off the bed in a very different way out of the depth. This is probably sidewall dominated. This is probably bottom dominated, which I think actually there's a point I raised in the chat that Blair uh, may be running into in the measurements she just presented because I think her aspect ratio is more one to one than we see in the environment. Here's the same flow at a later point in the tidal cycle. We're in a tidally forced for, uh, portion of the Sacramento River here. So much higher Reynolds number, higher shedding frequencies um, and um, sort of interesting um, results. Um, if we now move to a different location just around the corner at Sutter Slough, uh, a side channel to the Sacramento River and to play a little differently, here we're gonna put a camera up on a, a boom uh, forklift, and so that's about uh, 50 feet, 14 meters or so off the ground. Um, we've, we're going to be able to see the entire width of the river. Uh, here, here's that boom sticking up over the left bank of the river looking um, to the west, I believe. Seth could confirm that. Uh, and here is the orthorectified image with the ADV location right where I've got the pointer, the red triangle. We had some ADCPs upward looking on the bed as well. So as you can see, the orthorectified image gets all the way across the channel. Um, and what we're doing is we're imaging with a, a FLIR um, uh, medium range, medium wavelength infrared camera. That, um, that camera is about a one megapixel camera. It's also digitizing at 14 bits. It's a pricey camera. We're in the opposite spectrum that Blair just talked about. We are not in low cost. This is order $100,000 US camera. So it is not the solution for um, right now broad deployment, but we do hope to see a couple of things happen. One, infrared is becoming increasingly a valuable tool in the automotive industry, night vision on your rear view camera when you back up your car. So we're seeing much like we've seen in solar panels or scientific grade cameras, a rapid drop in cost in infrared. And we're hopeful in the coming decade that we will see these uh, level of accurate cameras fall into the maybe $10,000 or less range. 
Simultaneously, we're seeing rapid progress in low cost infrared cameras for those same applications that are using better technologies um, or more efficient technologies that are reducing both the, um, the resolution or the, the um, uh, millikelvin resolution we can see, we're seeing about 20 to 25 millikelvin here, um, and increasing the array size. One of the challenges of infrared cameras is they tend to have relatively modest um, array sizes. This is a one megapixel camera that sounds oh so, you know, 2000 to be working with a one megapixel camera in 2020. But for infrared, that's a really big camera and it's 100,000 US dollars. So in this camera, we're running at 10 Hertz. It can run faster than that. Um, but we are able to then select our Delta T at some integer multiple of 0.1 seconds. Turns out for this flow, five frames or 0.5 seconds is optimal. That number is gonna come back and, and, and um, bite us in a minute in, in an interesting way. We're working with 32 by 32 pixel sub windows. As Seth will talk about, we're actually doing the correlation before orthorectification and then only rectifying the, um, the, the results, the position of the vectors, not the entire image. Computationally much more efficient. We found that the accuracy is comparable. Um, we're working with a Sontac Hydra, much like Blair was, to sample in the water. We're about 1.5 meters below the surface, and we're about one meter horizontally from the IR QIV subwindow. So close, but not exactly the same spot. Certainly because we're below the free surface, we don't expect the exact same results. Um, Camera motion is a problem for all of us in a variety of deployments, unless you're on a really rigid structure. Um, even that bridge we were on when a truck went across, you could feel it move. Obviously, if you're on a drone, you're already dealing with IMUs, but we're moving in that direction. And we put an IMU up on the boom truck um, because the forklift both is susceptible to wind motions and its hydraulics slowly compress and we see the boom sag. So what we show here is from our um, extrinsic calibration, the position determination of the camera in the circles and the uh, real-time kinetic uh, GPS of the, or kinematic GPS of the boom as calculated by our RTK GPS system. And what you see is phenomenally good agreement in the horizontal and really good mean agreement as well in the vertical. The uncertainty on the um, uh, GPS is, is higher than the uncertainty on our orthorectification um, and extrinsic calibration. So we're really happy with the ability of the uh, ground control points to lock in our position. Seth's going to talk a little bit of, right after me about some of the uncertainty analysis we do to get that. So here's the image from the, from the boom truck. And now you can see the entire cross section of the river. You can see some of our ground control points located on various positions, uh, both banks and then out in the river. We do see a challenge here. We have a pretty good reflection from a, uh, a tree. Um, we can resolve and get velocities in there. You'll see that, but that is something that has to be dealt with in these kinds of images. There's a blank spot from the initial start of the run, but now you see we are tracking velocities in the trees. And what we see here are the eddies being swept through by the mean currents. If we now go take that one position over the ADV, we can take a look at this data in a bit more detail. So here's the time resolved QIV data or IR QIV and the ADV data. And what you see is that the two are seeing essentially the same flow. Obviously the details at the higher level of frequency, the smaller scales are different, but the overall large scales are very similar. We see downward trends at the large eddies, downward trends, um, and then it's a high resolution that is different. So we're capturing the main features of the flow that should be the same, the large scale eddies, and we're seeing deviations in the turbulence at scales of say less than 1.52 meters. If we go ahead and look at the spectra, then we can see that we're seeing the exact same spectra in both images. Um, the IRQIV is perhaps slightly um, uh, uh, attenuated compared to the ADV. Here I am using the variance um, normalized uh, spectra. So they should see exactly uh, the, the same thing if they're seeing the same um, turbulence intensity, which we'll see in a minute that they're more or less seeing the same turbulence intensity. What I wanna do is focus on the IRQIV. What you see here is that we have the minus five third slope, which we expect from turbulence. We do see some evidence of the inverse cascade on the free surface that one might expect because of the splats of the large scale three-dimensional turbulence rising up and interacting with the free surface, which of course two-dimensionalizes the turbulence. So this is something we're interested in looking into more, this uh, potential steepening slope as we get backscatter and the growth of larger eddies on the free surface that are producing boils. We also see this very flat noise floor and that noise floor is kicking in right at two Hertz. Now recall that our sampling rate effectively is two Hertz because we're using a Delta T 
of 0.5 seconds. So that spatial temporal filter is driving the noise floor. So if we want to be seeing data with spectral response characteristics higher than two hertz, we would need to actually be working with a smaller delta T. The trade-off there is when you select the delta T is all of you know, is you're trying to get enough displacement to have accurate displacement calculation and then ultimately velocity vectors when you divide by that delta T, but not so large that you've got decorrelation. And so we're kind of in that balance right now. But one of the things this suggests that could be really interesting, which we will start to play with, is dynamic determination of delta T. Using your delta T optimally, small delta Ts for fast regions of the flow, large delta Ts for slow regions of the flow. And of course, those are relative descriptions. What we find is in an oblique image, you have regions of the flow with small displacements just due to the magnification, due to ortho rectification. Um, and so this could be a really powerful technique for dynamically choosing your delta T across the images. If we look at the scatter plots of now just the um, uh, each instantaneous measurement from the IRQIV and the ADV, we see the very strong oblique um, uh, rotation of the V versus U from the surface measurements. Um, suggested that the sidewall boundary layer here actually is really driving a pretty strong set of, um, of rental stresses, and we'll see that mean rental stress in a second. Whereas at depth, I think in the combination of the bottom boundary layer interacting with the sidewall boundary layer, we're seeing a little bit more of a circular, but still a tilt in the correct direction due to the um, mean velocity profile. So here what I've done, and I think I made it so you guys can't see this perhaps, because I think I'm sharing my whole screen. Let me just change. that and get rid of that. Here we have IRQIV on the right and ADV on the left. So you see that the mean flows are the same. Truth be told here, what I've done is I've rotated the mean flow to be purely in the streamwise direction because of subtle rotations between the ADV and the, and the IRQIV, the camera. Um, so we forced this to be zero, that sets the rotation. And so there's the mean velocity. But if we look at the turbulence intensities, they're very comparable, but a little different. We expect them to be different. The surface PIV ought to see these splats that are rising up, leading to larger turbulent intensity on the surface. What should be preserved is the turbulent kinetic energy. So here we're calculating the turbulent kinetic energy of each. At the ADV, what we see is it, it's essentially to three decimal place accuracy the same as it is on the surface. So that each instrument is seeing exactly the same turbulent kinetic energy due to the splats reconfiguring at the ADV on the free surface. And what we have here is a rental stress that is comparable, but a little different, as I indicated, from the scatter plots. So Eric is going to talk, I think, in detail, and, and Blair already did, about the method for calculating bathymetry. We're going to take a little different approach here, still using integral length scales of the turbulence, as Blair um, outlaid them. But we're going to calculate that integral length scale, essentially in the method that people using STIS are using. We're going to do that um, integral length scale calculation in the infrared image intensity itself and look in the streamwise direction and look at the integral length scale of the image patterns, not of the velocity field. And if we do that, here are the streamwise directions I'm showing um, in the vertical. And in the bottom, I have each individual autocorrelation function as a function of its lag. Color is position. So these yellow are the, the far bank. These purple are the near bank, the green and blue are the intermediate banks. If we take those um, integral length scales and then try to construct an estimate of the bathymetry using the technique outlined in Eric and my paper, then what we have is that um, a comparison we can be made to the ADCP measurements. So we were out with a bottom tracking ADCP. We calculated through all the bottom trackings this set of the bathymetry. And so if we go take our integral length scale and take the median of each estimate and now scale that accordingly um, based on the, uh, a calibration, we have a estimate of the bathymetry directly from those surface mounted images. So this was calculated from 600 seconds of images, um, a 10 minute period, um, so one hertz data, and we see a quite accurate capture of the, uh, of the bathymetry which would be dynamically calculable from every set of images we have. So we could actually see the evolution of that bathymetry. In this case, we are um, um, not there long enough to actually see bathymetry change. So I'll finish up by saying some emerging questions we're really interested in thinking about are what are the effect of wind, waves, and stratification on these techniques? This has emerged in many of our talks as one of the challenges we all face for these surface imaging techniques 
And there we think are ways the infrared can help us decode the effects of these due to temperature changes. And of course, like all of you, we're really interested in getting these infrared cameras, like we are with visible up into drones. So I'll stop with a summary and I think I'm probably close on time. So I'll just leave that up and um, let you all take a read of it and see if yeah. there's any time for questions. Yeah, thank you very much for this very impressive talk and especially also the very, very nice images you've shown. Um, yeah, um, are there, is there a short question? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, one. Yes, uh, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, I have two questions. The first one is uh, is to ask who maybe I missed the information. What is the spectral range uh, covered by the camera? It's and a then, medium uh, medium wave infrared. So Seth can correct me when he jumps on if I've got it wrong, but it's in the sort of, um, I, I want to say three to eight range. Three to eight, okay. Uh, and and that's the second question is, um, is the how would you summarize uh, the hypothesis uh, that allows you to uh, convert the turbulence metrics into but into the bathymetry in terms of uh, in terms of flow. How would I summarize in terms of how would you how do you calculate it? No, the the, the hypothesis uh, on which uh, on which kind of uh, behavior. Sure. Uh, those What's the physical hypothesis behind it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's the idea is that those boils that I showed at the beginning are surface signatures of vortices, probably hairpin vortices generated at the bed. And they, when they interact, the, as the longer they travel, the larger they get. So depth is um, related to the length of time they travel vertically and hence the depth of the flow. And so that's the fundamental hypothesis. And what Erica uh, may talk about tomorrow, I believe, and is certainly covered in the paper from 2016 that we put together is that, uh, as Blair just showed, at least for the streamwise uh, um, um, mean velocity or streamwise velocity length scale, that that, that correlation is linear and is positive. I'm a little confused as she is by her other finding, but I do think it's because of the aspect ratio of the channel. Okay, uh, thank you very much.